Welcome to Neuropraxis Family and Friends, a TBI Survivor Support Group Week 2 module. We kindly ask that you complete this survey by scanning the QR code or accessing the link in the description box below. It will only take about one minute and will gather your baseline knowledge before continuing on to the educational portion of this module. After watching this module, you will gain a general understanding of communication deficits following a brain injury and common mistakes in communicating with your loved one with a brain injury. You will also have a general understanding of helpful communication and conflict management techniques that can support your relationship with your loved one. As a disclaimer, this is not an extensive list as your loved one may or may not exhibit these specific deficits. We have listed common deficits seen within the rehab setting. Brain injury survivors may have a hard time understanding and processing spoken or written words. In turn, this can lead to them needing more time in grasping what is being said or them requiring a repeating of what was just asked of them. They may have a hard time finding the right words to express their needs, and this can be frustrating and lead to upset or sadness. Also, these deficits can include impaired attention, such as being unable to filter extraneous noises, such as a car passing by while someone is asking them about their day. This can also impair the social and emotional processing of someone who survived a brain injury. So this can look like being unaware of how fast and how much they are speaking, which can look like interrupting others to share something that may be inappropriate or showing lack of empathy by joking about somebody else's misfortune. And this is due to limited insight on how much their words or actions can make somebody feel. Now we'll go over how damage to certain areas of the brain can look like in everyday life. So if someone receives an injury to the temporal lobe, this can look like being hard of hearing, having a hard time understanding spoken word, learning new things, being able to move their attention to and from different sounds from the environment, like being able to pay attention to your question about their morning while the dishwasher is humming in the background. Damage to this region can even lead to auditory hallucinations, like hearing strange sounds or voices. Brain injury can result in aphasia, which is a loss of being able to translate one's thoughts to understandable language or understand the meaning of spoken or written language. There are two broad types of aphasia known as fluent and fluent aphasia. Non-fluent is also known as Broca's aphasia, which is the result of damage to the Broca's area near the temporal lobe. The Broca's area provides us the ability to speak and self-express. Common symptoms of Broca's aphasia include being unable to name common items like a cup or a house key, or not using leaking words, such as and, the, and is. The non-fluent component of Broca's aphasia may sound like, remote me please, instead of saying, pass me the remote please. Wernicke's aphasia, or also known as Fluent aphasia is caused by damage to the Wernicke's area, which is also located near the temporal lobe. They can speak at a normal rate and rhythm with proper grammar. However, the sentences have no meaning. This is known as word salad. It may sound like this. The pawn shop looked warm where we washed the car like you did tomorrow. That could have been a response to what did you eat for breakfast this morning? Hence, their language is fluent but incomprehensible. However, communication is not simply about hearing or processing speech or even thinking of a response and producing that response via our mouths. It can also include our vision, like reading body language, sharing the same visual experience, like watching a Netflix series together, and even writing. Our brain's projector, known as the occipital lobe, is known for its ability to help us make sense of our visual world, such as seeing different colors, seeing the full area of our vision, or even reading a birthday card. Damage to this area can lead to visual hallucinations that are distorted images of what is actually happening or even seeing something that is not there. Also, nerve damage can lead to being unable to see the specific angle or lead to tunnel vision. This can look like the inability to recognize the difference between colors, shapes, 
written language, or being unable to see one object at a time. The frontal lobe is our center of higher level cognition, behavior, and emotional control. Thus, any damage to this area can result in poor decision making, like saying rude comments, being unable to plan what to do in their day, and processing complex or even basic instructions like placing a cup on the counter to making an omelet, or even having an extreme outburst to mundane occurrences. Here is a visual of all the lobes we spoke about. This is the left side of our brain. The Broca's area is located slightly in the front area of the temporal lobe, and the Wernicke's area is located at the top back portion of the temporal lobe. At this time, you can follow along to this video or click the link to watch it on your own browser. The ability to understand language and produce speech is associated with several areas of the cerebral cortex. Basically, spoken language is first perceived in the auditory cortex, while written text or sign language is processed in the visual cortex. This information is then sent to the Wernicke's area in the temporal lobe, where it is matched against the person's vocabulary stored in the memory. This is where meaning is assigned to words and language comprehension is achieved. The signals are then transmitted via a bundle of nerve fibers, known as the arcuate fasciculus, to Broca's area in the frontal lobe. Broca's area is responsible for production of speech. Output from Broca's area goes to the motor cortex, which controls muscle movements necessary for speech. A language disorder caused by brain damage is called aphasia. Lesions in the Wernicke's area cause sensory or receptive aphasia. Wernicke's aphasics have trouble understanding language, whether it is spoken or written, but have no motor problems. They can speak at a fluent pace, but their speech is often incoherent. It can be described as a strange mixture of words that may sound like complete sentences, but make no sense and has nothing to do with the subject of conversation. Patients with lesions in the Broca's area, on the other hand, can understand language, but have difficulty speaking. They talk slowly, searching for words, forming incomplete sentences with poor syntax, but usually manage to say important words to get their message across. In the early days, research of language pathways was based mainly on studying patients who had a specific language deficit that could be associated with a specific brain damage. Nowadays, advanced brain imaging techniques allows mapping in real time the areas of the brain that are activated when a person carries on a specific task. Thanks to these techniques, a third area is found to be essential for language comprehension, the inferior parietal lobule. This lobule is not only connected to both Wernicke's and Broca's, but also to the auditory, visual, and somatosensory cortical areas. The inferior parietal lobule is therefore perfectly wired to perform a multimodal, complex synthesis of information. It can process and connect different word elements, such as the sound of the word, with the look and feel of the object. The language centers are usually located in only one hemisphere. The dominant hemisphere of the brain, which is the left side in right-handed people. The corresponding areas in the right hemisphere are responsible for the emotional aspect of language. Lesions in the right hemisphere do not affect speech comprehension or formation, but result in emotionless speech and inability to understand the emotion behind the speech, such as sarcasm or a joke. The right hemisphere may also develop to take over the main language functions if the left side is damaged in early childhood. This phenomenon is known as neuroplasticity. Now that we have learned how brain injury can impact how our loved one communicates, we will now learn of common communication mistakes when communicating with our loved ones with the TBI. So as a disclaimer, I am in no way accusing or saying that you have personally made these communication mistakes. I am using examples described in emotional intelligence research and from what I have seen during my clinical experience. Examples of reacting to a situation include talking over your loved one in an argument or assuming their behavior was done intentionally and they do not love or care about you or anyone else. Also, the timing of when we bring up what is impacting the relationship is also very important. When speaking about the things that hurt us, especially in our close relationships, it's important of being mindful of how we word our concerns. 
The communication technique we will go over today is using I statements over using you statements. Again, I will acknowledge that I am not accusing or saying that you have said these in any moment, but they are just examples to understand the negative impact of using you statements. So you statements can sound like, you always treat me like a doormat and I feel like you're being a total jerk right now. Or, at least I'm not as mean to you as you are to me. These statements are examples of generalizing you statements. They are unclear because they don't mention the specific behavior that was hurtful. They are also judgmental due to the name calling aspect. And the word choices are emotionally charged. Using you statements will most likely cause an even bigger argument and lead to regret later. You have most likely heard the term communication is key in regards to strengthening your relationships. However, that saying it's missing a vital component. Communicating well is key in finding the solutions that work. A study published in 2022 by Del Torres et al. found that brain injury-based caregivers or family members were able to improve their mood in the midst of stressors when caring for the loved one. And they achieved this by using emotional intelligence principles which is considered the capacity to control one's own emotions, including the timing, nature, and expression of their occurrence. This can be done by acknowledging the personality change following a brain injury or most likely involuntary, and by making the personal choice of choosing to respond in that moment over reacting. You can also use these tips when establishing a plan or addressing concerns with family members or spouses who share the responsibility of caring for your loved one. Before I get started, I wanted to acknowledge that your emotions are valid in any experience, especially as a caregiver. And creating a solution to these occurrences is important for not only your well-being, but for your loved one's recovery. However, these methods may not be easy to do, but with practice, they can become more and more familiar and useful. The formula consists of either starting by saying, I felt or I feel, followed by a specific emotion you experience from a specific action they have taken, then offering a solution. For example, I felt sad when you raised your voice at me earlier. I would appreciate it if you would speak to me calmly or emphasize how a potential solution is important to you and how it makes you feel when it occurs. Now I will refer to the second bullet point as an example. It is important to me when you speak to me calmly because it makes me feel respected. These two examples will help mitigate the fight or flight response in our loved ones because it's coming from a place of positivity and genuine regard about your boundaries and your loved one's well-being. However, it is easy to slip in you statements into this formula and I will go over how you can avoid this. So sneaking in any type of judgment that can insinuate them as being a bad person or being a jerk will make the I statements ineffective. That can sound like, I feel like you are a total jerk or I felt like you did it on purpose. Although we began the sentence with I feel, we ended it with a judgment. And in turn, this will make our loved one feel attacked and this is not effective communication. At this time, you can pause the video and try out one or both strategies. And once you're ready, you can start the video back up again. Here we'll go over coping strategies for communication deficits. So the first tip is emphasizing being empathetic towards yourself when trying new methods as they may be challenging at first, but it will take some time to remember and get used to. And remember the cause of these communication deficits and identify potential barriers to their performance. This way they can feel supported in future conversations. When waiting for their response, give them extra time to process what you have said and for them to form a response. But resist the urge to finish their sentences. They may need extra time to find the right words. Lastly, offering or asking them how you can help can provide them comfort and a sense of independence in that moment. The next tip emphasizes clarity. Make sure you have your loved one's attention before you start speaking to them and making sure that they are aware by either looking for their eye contact or watching their body language. 
You can also eliminate distractions such as turning down the TV, dimming the lights, or adjusting the thermostat if possible. And if your loved one has a communication deficit like aphasia, avoid open-ended questions and utilize closed-ended questions. So instead of asking, how was your day? Instead ask, did you have a good day? Or did you sleep well? This allows them a quicker response, yes or no, without feeling the pressure to elaborate right away. And be concise in describing what is important by following the I statement technique and be flexible by offering additional clarification. If they seem confused, you can always ask, does that make sense? Or would you like me to explain again? This will ensure you both are on the same page. Acknowledging their experience of the scenario can also help establish a middle ground. But using validating phrases such as, I could see how that can make you feel angry or I know how much that meant to you. Paraphrasing is a direct way to show that their thoughts and feelings were understood. And this can be done by starting off, it sounds like you are saying, then in your own words, share what you think they meant, then offer an opportunity to clarify by asking, did I get it right? Then repeat this process until an understanding or middle ground is established. If you or your loved one are comfortable, offering a hug or holding their hand in that moment can also help. Lastly, being an active listener is key. So you can use all the prior tips, but if you're not showing you're actively listening, this can come off as being uninterested in what they have to say. This can be done by facing your loved one when they're speaking, making eye contact, nodding, paraphrasing their key points, asking clarifying questions, giving your full attention by stopping what you are doing. Continued here, we'll go over techniques in managing conflict as a caregiver using emotional intelligence-based principles. The first step emphasizes the importance of timing. If you or your loved one are able to alleviate the issue without insult or dispute, then move forward in using the active listening and the I statement techniques we discussed earlier. Or if the situation cannot be alleviated due to a dispute, then if safe to do so, acknowledge that right now is not the best time to find a solution and both of you could need some space for the moment being. This can be done by going to the other room or exercising to release some stress. This is also a way for you to get your endorphins flowing through your body so that you can come back to the situation in a calm manner. The best time to bring up the situation is when your loved one is well rested in order to avoid agitation or continued upset. The next step emphasizes reading cues of when to approach the situation. It is best to approach any situation when your loved one is in a calm or neutral state. Also be mindful of your own tone, facial expression, or if your arms are folded across your body or you're facing away from your loved one as this may come off as being disinterested. Also, some medications may cause drowsiness, confusion, or make your loved one more prone to irritation. Knowing their medication routine will also be a way of avoiding conflict. Once you are both ready to talk about the situation, you can use a sandwich method we have discussed in our first module by starting off with a compliment, following up with constructive feedback, which will be your I statement, then ending with encouragement to elicit a positive response from your loved one. And this can sound like, I appreciate how much of a loving father you are to our kids, but when you raised your voice at Amelia last night, I felt really sad. I know lately she has been going to bed on time, but it's important to me that we both speak calmly to our kids. I know this may be hard, but I have faith that you can handle it. And after you both have come to an understanding, you and your loved one can set boundaries that can prevent this from happening again, like having a routine where you and your husband take turns putting the children to sleep during the week. If you notice any sudden changes in communication or their behavior, make note of any occurrences that happened before or immediately after, the frequency or any medications that may be contributing to these new behaviors, and most importantly, let their healthcare team know so that they can come up with a plan to mitigate these behaviors. And remember, consistent practice makes progress. I would like to emphasize that we all come from different cultural backgrounds, and that can impact how we approach conversations, how much responsibility we take on while caring for our loved ones, or what we consider as respectful communication and body language. When trying any new method to help you or your loved one, it is important to establish a shared solution or understanding as setting personal boundaries or trying new ways of communication may be hard to get used to at first. But taking better care of yourself can only benefit how well you're able to care for others. Also, 
Being open to trial and error is key within brain injury recovery, as not one brain injury is the same. Some strategies may not work the first time. Some of our loved ones may need additional time to process the changes in their bodies. Or with consistent practice and slight changes, these strategies can become a useful part of your lives. Now we will go over some key takeaways of this module. Practicing emotional intelligence can help you and your loved one work together in finding solutions that work. Additionally, there's no one size fits all. Thus, be patient with yourself and your loved one as you both brainstorm or try new ideas in communicating with each other and managing conflict throughout the brain injury recovery process. We kindly ask that you complete our second survey to gather how much you have learned from this module. You can also access the link in the description box below. Here are some safety resources we have provided for you. We have also provided some communication resources that may support your loved one. And here are some counseling resources that can support your mental health. We would like to thank all of the brain injury researchers, organizations, and websites that have provided the information that is included within this module. This module was created by Vanessa Rivera, an occupational therapy doctorate student at West Coast University Center for Graduate Studies and doctor intern at Neuropraxis Rehab under the supervision of Christine Weaver, the CEO and founder of Neuropraxis Rehab and an occupational therapist with over 29 years of experience in the brain injury rehab setting. This module's material is for information and support and not a substitute for a doctor or healthcare team advice for you or your loved one.